this is the talk that you're in right now. Uh, we're going to talk about distributed refactoring with Gradle Lint. And we're going to have a, a mixture of discussion here and also some demos. So if you're uh, interested in following along uh, or just cloning the, the example we'll use today, um, I'm going to leave this footer at the bottom of the screen, the whole presentation. You can just go to github.com uh, slash Netflix Gradle Summit slash Lint. And that's where um, the example code will be that we're working with. So with no further ado, Netflix is an organization uh, that is known for rapid innovation. We, uh, we're known for uh, building in new features very quickly, uh, you know, hiring the, the best and the brightest that are, that are able to churn out new features. Um, and unfortunately, um, whenever you have a technology adoption curve, you have those kind of like the early majority adopters. You, you get uh, you know, innovation happening really f uh, fast in a forward direction. Um, you also have to deal with that uh, that long tail of uh, of late adopters, and uh, and that can that can introduce a little drag on your organization and prevent you from from moving forward as quickly as you want. Uh, we introduced Gradle uh, itself just from the build tools perspective. We introduced Gradle itself in about early 2014 into the Netflix organization, and I think we were more or less fully on on Gradle by the end of 2014. Uh, and honestly, you know, Gradle has changed quite a bit since then. Uh, one of the earliest versions we used was Gradle 1.12, so there was a major uh, migration effort with, uh, with 2.0 and 2.x versions of Gradle. And, uh, and we also just, you know, made some decisions that we, um, that we regret or that, you know, th the conditions have changed and, and we'd like to, to get people to move forward. Unfortunately, even in that two years, even in that two years of working with with Gradle builds at Netflix, um, it's it can be hard. You know, we, we can develop plugins, we can develop extensions and things that we that we then change and we want to move forward. Uh, but we've got something like four or five thousand distinct Gradle files uh, in the wild at Netflix, and getting everybody to to move forward on all those changes can be quite an endeavor. Um, so one thing we did, uh, you know, early on is we started to try to uh, try to adapt plugins or change extensions is we try to write up really great depreca deprecation warnings that said, you know, I know we're using this, but, you know, we'd like you to move on to this, please, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, and uh, we we're just finding that people, uh, the developers just weren't adopting those, those uh, they weren't reacting to those deprecation warnings very quickly. Um, furthermore, at at Netflix, Netflix is a culture, has a culture of freedom and responsibility. So uh, even though myself and, and Rob and, and Nadav and Danny, some of the other folks that we've got here, um, are a centralized build tools or developer productivity team at Netflix, we don't control the uh, team's builds. They control, control their own builds. They control their own pace of adoption. Um, and this helps us actually uh, like develop uh, really cool features um, in ways that are you know, every team is different. They have uh, they have different needs. They have different testing cycles. They have different uh, you know languages that they're using. Um, so they need to be able to adopt change at, at different rates. Um, so um, I, you know, born out of frustration with uh, with with teams not uh, you know following deprecation warnings and emails and, and attempts to communicate, um, we came up with with Gradle Lint. So Gradle Lint allows us to distribute change. So uh, you're probably familiar with linting tools in other languages. Basically just perform some static analysis on the, you know, whatever it is a subject to being lint, and then emits violations. It says, you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, et cetera. Um, this isn't a, you know, much of a different mechanism than what we were doing already, just emitting deprecation warnings. Um, Gradle lint allows us to also write uh, auto-fixing logic um, such that whenever there's a, a violation in one of the uh, the build files, um, the rule also packs with the logic necessary to just uh, just correct the problem. Um, so a user or an engineer at Netflix may be presented with, you know, 10 or 20 or 100 different uh, Gradle lint violations that they can see in their their build output, but running this one command, uh, Gradle w fix uh, Gradle lint, will just correct them all on their behalf. So it makes that you know that adoption a lot simpler. Um, we use uh, Gradle Lint to uh, remove cruft from builds. So you know we've got 
old extensions that, that we no longer have any need for. A good example of this is when we were uh, migrating from Java 6 to Java 7, we added an extension property called ready for Java 7. <laughs> you know, and you know, even in recent months, even though we've long since been on Java 8, you could still see that extension property ready for Java 7 hanging around in people's builds. So that's no longer necessary. We'd, we'd like that to just be swept up. We also uh, sometimes want to use it to bar bad practices. Um, since, again, there's about four of us that support Gradle, and there's you know, eight or 900 engineers that we support, as people come to us with questions, we'll often see you know, re repeated patterns of misuse that, that cause people difficulty. Uh, so where we can identify those patterns, we'd rather just you know, write a rule so that others don't encounter it, don't have to come to us. Um, Gradle Lint, the way it basically functions, uh, it, uh, it's just really an extension on top of CodeNARC. Um, so it, it's a, uh, a mechanism that has access to both the abstract syntax tree of the, the Gradle file itself and also um, the, Gradle, the configured Gradle model object. So we can you know, look deep down into the Gradle model state, and we can also look at the abstract syntax tree. Any auto fixes uh, wind up being um, generated into just a regular Unix diff patch file, ultimately. And then the fix process just applies that patch to your, to your repository. Um, so we'll go into, well, let's uh, discuss, you know, an example. So an example rule that um, is floating around there in open source. We've got some rules in open source. We've got some internally. This is a, an example rule we have in open source called the unused dependency rule. And it's designed to help uh, maintain good dependency hygiene. Uh, we, uh, Netflix is a binary integration organization. So all of our uh, library producers produce binaries and they're consumed in that way. We're, we're, we don't have a monorepo, uh, you know, unlike other uh, big tech organizations in the Bay Area. Um, what we find is that um, that you know dependencies get added to Gradle files, but they're seldom removed. Um, so uh, whenever you add a dependency that's unused, and then that dependency uh, gets used by a direct consumer, and then you know two levels down, and three levels down, and four levels down, uh, it just this this the unused dependencies wind up magnifying um, the uh, the scope of the transitive closure of, of dependencies uh, way downstream of it. So if we can eliminate those unused dependencies early on, uh, it just it, it helps the organization as a whole. Um, to, to demonstrate this, we'll go over to the, uh, the IDE. And I've just got a little toy project. This is the toy project that I was referring to on our GitHub repo. It's just got a simple, uh, you know, no-nonsense main method right here that has a method called say hello. I had to really contrive an example here of a use of Guava. Um, so it uses the joiner class from the Guava uh, library. And, you know, we test this thing as well, so we're using JUnit here as well. And if you look at the Gradle file itself, um, we have three dependencies here. We have Guava, the dependency we're actually using. We have commons lang, which we're not using, uh, and we have JUnit defined as a compiled dependency, which is something, uh, unfortunately, we see uh, should be a test compiled dependency because right now this compiled dependency is going to wind up in, you know, a POM or an IV file that we produce, and it's going to wind up getting included in the transitive closure of anybody downstream of me. Um, so we can go to the uh, to the command line here, and we're going to just cause compilation to happen here, um, and we'll we'll run Lint Gradle. <coughs> Ooh, dependency resolution, and what you see is uh, a couple violations here. We see that the commons lang dependency is unused as we know, and that the JUnit uh, dependency here uh, really should be moved to the test compile configuration. So this rule has actually looked at um, the, the classes, uh, the class binaries of this project and counted references to various dependencies and has organized its understanding of which dependency should be where according to which source set the classes were in uh, and can correct it. So um, this is the kind of lint 
rule that you'd expect to find in a lot of languages. Um, we've even gone through the effort of making it nice and colorized so that it's hard to miss. Um, it, it, it always runs at the end of the build so that lint warnings are always the last thing that you see no matter what so that you know it's not possible that these things just get lost in the sea of other output. Um, but to make things really easy, the key here is that we uh, are able to run fixed grade of lint. I'm just forcing uh, dependency resolution to happen uh, because I'm being paranoid. Um, and you'll see here that uh, it, it just basically emits a report of what it's fixed. And if we look at the file itself, we'll see that we're only left now with two dependencies, the Guava dependency on the compile configuration and the test compile dependency now on JUnit. Um, so this is cool because we've, we've kind of been trained to believe that Gradle is like Gradle builds can be a mess of imperative code and so that it's like it's not subject to static code analysis, it's not subject to automatic manipulation by tools. Uh, and while there are some like, you're gonna be able to imagine these like really, uh, you know, deep, uh, difficult edge cases uh, for like the vast majority of the, case, the cases that we encounter. Um, AST is simple enough that we can make these kind of manipulations and get some good, good wins out of it. Um, so that's unused dependencies right there. Um, well, now this was kind of a contrived example. So you, I, you know, there's only three dependencies here. Uh, I do want to show you an example of a, uh, a Netflix yeah, yeah, go right ahead. What, I, I see that uh, something's missing there, but was something changed as well? Absolutely. So this, you can see where this used to be a uh, compiled dependency, okay. and now it's a test compiled dependency. So that dependency is no longer going to leak downstream unintentionally. I'm sorry? The, the, yeah, good question. The question was, does it modify Kotlin? Not yet. Um, but when Kotlin support gets a little more fully baked, we're, we're real, real, real Kotlin lovers, um, you can bet that <laughs> it'll be there. Um, it, you know, a great example of where uh, there was a compiled dependency that should have been a runtime dependency and it really hurt us as an organization was, was Finebugs. Finebugs had a, a version that um, was compatible with Java 7 but not with Java 8. You know, it had been placed on the compiled uh, class path somewhere in a really low level library. When we tried to, you know, you know move on to Java 8, uh, that fine bugs dependency just, uh, it just haunted us um, for a while as we, as we, you know, move projects along. Um, so it's, you know, dependency hygiene can be important. We'll go to an actual uh, Netflix repository, an open source repository. Um, GitHub. This is the Priam project. And this is a good example. Priam is a Cassandra sidecar uh, that Netflix, you know, uh, has open sourced. And it's written by some folks that are really knowledgeable about uh, Cassandra and, you know, just this, this, you know, really difficult problems in that space. Um, I'm glad we have them. But their first, like, as engineers, they're, you know, Dependency management is not their area of expertise. Their area of expertise is in, is in Cassandra. Um, and so, not surprisingly, we wind up having a, you know, a build file that, that grows and grows and grows over time. So just run this against uh, Priam and you see that it fixed 67 dependencies. Um, if you just look at the git diff that's been created here, all of these dependencies that were in Priam were not used. Um, you know, a few of them we decided, ah, oh, there's really need to be runtime dependencies. Um, you know, Xerxes, definitely a runtime dependency. Uh, and then in some cases, this is something I hadn't mentioned before, but they had a dependency on a, a bundle jar, like, uh, the AWS Java SDK, which is actually a zero byte jar that has a POM file that just includes all the other AWS components. Now, Priam is actually only using a few pieces of AWS. It's only using the, you know, the 
auto scaling piece, an EC2 piece, uh, maybe S3, simple DB, so a few things. Um, but they've included that whole bundle, which means all the AWS SDK is going downstream, if there were any downstreams of Priam. Um, so the, uh, the unused dependency rule is also able to uh, look at transitive dependencies that you actually have dependencies on, that you actually have references to, and add them as first order dependencies. So I'm gonna strike that zero by jar, which I can't possibly have a dependency on because there's nothing in it, and I'll add all the components that I'm actually using. Um, and this, this is a good uh, like usability feature, right? If I'm starting a project that depends on AWS, the AWS Java SDK, I don't really know which components I need yet, I'll just add the family jar, I'll do some coding, I'll run the rule, and it'll strip it down to the things I actually need. Um, it's a good practical example there. So what does it look like to actually write a rule? Uh, if we started from um, nothing, we'll, we'll go ahead and write a rule here, which is just uh, a simple, you know, let's move from Java, suppose our organization wants to move from Java 7 to Java 8, and we see some uh, source compatibility, target compatibility references scattered throughout our build files that explicitly pin to version 1.7. I've gone ahead and written the, the Spock test for this already, just to save some time. Uh, we're, we're going to, we're actually using something very similar to TestKit. This could be converted to using TestKit right now, so you just, some of you just saw that uh, demonstrated by Ben. Um, we're gonna create an example uh, build file here with source and target compatibility. We're gonna say we wanna run our rules against uh, uh, Java 8, the Java 8 version rule we're gonna create. And then we're gonna demonstrate that it violates, that the, the build file up here violates the uh, Java 8 version rule. And that ultimately what we want to have is source and target compatibility equal to 1.8. Um, so to write a rule, you simply uh, create a class that extends Gradle lint rule. And in, inside Gradle lint rule, we've got uh, all of these these visit sort of methods. So this is an AST visitor, ultimately. It's an extension of the CodeNARC AST visitor, which is in turn an extension of the Groovy AST visitor. But we've also added some things like uh, Gradle specific DSL constructs, like visit apply plugin, or visit Gradle dependency, or visit uh, extension property, and so, things like that. So uh, you can quickly get to little pieces of the Gradle DSL that um, that are useful. For our case, um, this like source and target compatibility thing is, is kind of an outlier in terms of the Gradle DSL. So it's actually a binary expression. And we're just, uh, we're gonna say like if the, uh, the left expression is an instance of variable expression, I don't know what else it could honestly be, but um, sometimes my understanding of what's possible with these ASTs is somewhat limited. So, and just to make this rule simple, um, we're going to assume that you're you're using a uh, constant expression. So, if you have some like crazy logic that's evaluating the the source and target compatibility based on some parameterization, we're just not going to deal with it. Um, again, so these rules are meant to be practical, like cover the 99% case, and you can add logic as you see ne uh, you know a need for it later on. So the variable itself that we're trying to get from the left hand side of the expression, we can just get like this. And we're gonna say if the variable is you know, equal to source compatibility or it's equal to the target compatibility. Then, um, and furthermore, if the you know, right expression is you know, not what we expect, it's not 1.8, then we're gonna just add a build lint violation here. We're gonna provide some message. So this is the message that was surfaced uh, in the console up here. This is the message that appears here. I say upgrade to Java 8. And we're gonna provide some marker of where, like, where this was found. Uh, this is optional. Um, it's possible to create a lint violation that is, is just, just always fires or fires under certain conditions but isn't based on a specific part of the AST. It's just like a general problem I'm trying to solve. In this case, there's a specific AST element that, I'm, that I, I see as a problem and I can add that. 
when I add that, that AST element hint right there, it allows the Gradle Wimp plugin to admit something like this. So it says that the violation actually occurred in build.gradle at line 42, and this was the actual text of the AST that violated it. So you can see it right there. It's not just a message. Um, but again, that's optional. And you can say, you know, let's replace this. Again, we're going to replace this whole expression, this, this binary expression that we're working with, with a variable um, equal to uh, 1.8. And that's it. That's really, that's, that's how it goes. Um, and is it, is it right that the replace with just won't run if you're not doing fix target? That's right. Okay. Yeah, so that when you run just uh, lint gradle, what's produced is that patch file. It's just called like lint.patch, and it's produced in your build directory. Um, the patch file isn't applied unless you're running the fixes. So um, we, we have a kind of fluent API here, so, you know, Sometimes, uh, you know, a good example is, you know, we have a platform dependency, uh, you know, or we have a runtime platform team that provides some functionality to everybody. People will express a dynamic constraint like latest out release on that, and we want them to instead remove the version and apply like a, a bomb recommendation source, like the Spring Dependency Management plugin does this, and we want to add that other construct. So in addition to replacing something, I could also insert uh, additional things, you know, you could delete pieces. You'll notice here we have things like uh, delete file. Uh, so we use delete file and add file and things like that in the rule that we have internally to um, force everybody to upgrade their Gradle wrapper. Um, you know, sometimes we want to delete old sim links that they have and other weird things that they have in their, in their uh, directory and insert a nice clean Gradle wrapper. So that's, a, that's an uh, option for you as well. And that's it. So that's, that's uh, writing a rule. Now this rule that we just uh, demonstrated uh, only has knowledge of the AST. Like I didn't use any features related to the great old model itself. Um, so let's go over, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's go create a little bit more of a complex rule. Suppose we wanted to have, like we wrote a plugin called Netflix.warpublish. And we wanted everybody that created a war in the organization to publish it to our binary repository. Um, so we could start out with a simple rule. And this rule uses, again, one of these, like, these uh, Gradle-specific DSL things, visit apply plugin. And we could say, you know, if the plugin is the war plugin, then you, know, you must also apply the Netflix war publish plugin. So that's great. That's the first step right there. Now in step two, we think, you know, if the war plugin was applied, but they already had applied the war publish plugin, we don't want to apply it again. You know, we don't want to insert another line. So here we use a feature of Gradle Lint that allows us to bookmark certain AST elements as we see them. And then later on in class complete, you know, this last visitor that gets called, we can look up the various uh, AST elements. So if we saw an apply war, uh, uh, expression, and we didn't see an apply war publish expression, then we want to add the violation and make sure that the apply war publish gets inserted right after where we applied the war plugin. So we can use that bookmark both to check if something has already happened and also as an anchor you know, to use in the actual autofix rule um, to, to add additional things later on. Um, Next, suppose we, when we created this war publish plugin, when, like whenever we create an opinionated plugin like this, if I apply a war publish, I probably also want to apply war. So it's likely that uh, in this case, our war publish plugin implementation would also automatically apply war. So it's similar except for when I see apply war and the war publish plugin isn't yet applied, um, then I'll replace um, the war plugin looks like I missed it here, but I would add an additional line that said remove the apply war, or actually, yeah, replacement work. So I'm replacing the apply war plugin with war publish right here. So just a one for one uh, substitution there. And then lastly, uh, we can become Gradle model aware. So it's possible that I applied some other plugin um, that applied the war plugin, but that's not visible to me 
from the AST. You wouldn't actually see it in the code because it's being applied some other way. Uh, and so here, rather than just checking the, the, uh, the bookmark for whether the war published plugin is applied, I can use the Gradle model to say, you know, if this, if this project has this plugin applied, uh, then, then insert this, uh, this new one. Um, so this kind of shows you how we can synthesize the, the uh, evaluated Gradle model with what we see in the AST and make decisions accordingly. Are there any questions about writing rules? I'll stop there for a minute. Uh, writing rules and what the capabilities are and so forth. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great example. So, uh, and I should have mentioned that. Um, we have a construct like this where you can basically just, you can either ignore all rules by just leaving this as a zero parameter thing. And you can just wrap this around anything, anywhere in your, in your build.gradle. Or you can, you can ignore specific rules. Um, so that's a little escape hatch for you. Yes, sir. Can you detect overuse of the escape hatch? That is an excellent segue, I'll, I'll tell you what. Because what, what I was going to say is Gradle Lint supports shipping metrics to uh, our Nebula metrics plugin as well. Um, so we do this. We, uh, we see violations you know, getting shipped out. And we can kind of aggregate those violations by team, uh, by project, and so forth. Um, we don't have a feature right now to ship the ignores, but I mean that's a like a easy feature that can be added. Um, what's nice about the metrics is we can just float a rule. Um, those early adopters are going to do it right away. They're going to say fix rate alignment. They're going to pick it up right away, and we can watch it kind of diminish over time a little bit. And then you know ultimately, if there's just a few parties that are left over that haven't adopted the rule, those are probably people we want to talk to because uh, maybe there's something. You know, maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe it's you know it's difficult for them for some reason, um, but it gives us you know like a targeted group to go after um, rather than trying to go after everybody. Um, Do you also use that to get rid of rules that are no longer That's exactly right. You you the question was: Do you get rid of that? Um, Do you use that to get rid of rules that are no longer firing? Um, that is. Like that's one use case. The other one, uh, and we don't quite have support for this yet, but there are different violation levels, and we can add an extension property to Gradle Lint to say actually fail to build if you're over a certain level. That's a common feature of many linters. So you know, one thing we imagine is when you know the violations go to zero on a particular violation, we might turn that thing to an error to slam the door behind you know behind uh, teams. So that because sometimes you have like. You know, I have 5,000 source repositories, you know, in GitHub and Stash and all over the place. And really only like 1,000 of those are actively being worked on and built at any given time. But that doesn't mean that somebody isn't going to go find like project 4,900 over here and copy something out of it and put it in one of their new projects. And that's, you know, some like bad practice that we've since purged from the organization but somehow like comes back uh, to haunt us later on. So I think when we do that, we'll probably, you know, uh, Increase the level to error and just you know close the door behind people, um, and it's important. So like you know as a, again as a centralized build tools team, we have freedom and responsibility. So if we as a, as the four of us create an error that breaks 100 teams, we're not allowing them the opportunity to adopt change at their own rate, and we're not really you know being good citizens of freedom and responsibility. But if we can help make sure they they all get through it successfully and then close the door behind them, then that fits that model pretty well. Any other questions about the like the rule capabilities or um, anything like that at this moment? Yes. Another great, great question. I should have mentioned that as well. So it works very similar to the way the Gradle plugins mechanism works. We just have a, you know in the meta in folder there's a, a lint dash rules. Uh, folder, and you create you create the name of the rule, so Java dash version dot properties, and you just have the simple implementation class equals uh, Java eight version rule here. Additionally, you can create uh, lint rules that um, 
like let's say I create one called all versions dot properties, and you could say includes Java version, Groovy version, whatever. You know, so you could include, so you can create rules that are aggregates of other rules, um, and then include those as well. Um, Yeah. So now this this project right here, this rules project, would pack with uh, my rule logic itself, and it also has you know meta influent rules. All this gets rolled up into a jar, and if I add this to the build script class path, then that rule is available to me to apply. Um, so. As a centralized build tools team, we have a whole package of Netflix specific Gradle lint rules, and we can just version that. Um, everybody else has a dynamic constraint to pick up the latest. And we have one big like composite rule called all Netflix that they're always applying all the time. And so we can pull rules in and you know insert them and remove them and, and you know and so forth. So we just have to version that one thing. That's how that works. Could you apply it in build source as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So great. Um, we. Let's, now that I've gone back and forth a little bit, um, Great Alint is. So in working on this, we've kind of come to a, a, a further realization here. Great Alint is our first what we call a distributed refactoring tool, or what my manager there, Mike McGar, calls a distributed refactoring tool. This guy's a genius when it comes up to coming up with phrases. Um, it's like the floodgates have kind of opened for us in a way. Now that we realize that you know, even, a, even a, like a relatively imperative piece of code is subject to this kind of static analysis and manipulation, uh, we, can, we can leverage this capability in other ways as well. Um, one good example is this, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Nebula Dependency Lock plugin. Uh, the Nebula Dependency Lock plugin just takes a, your, your, uh, the versions that you've got defined in your, um, your Gradle file, many of which may be dynamic constraints like latest.release or one.plus or so forth, and it generates a uh, dependency lock file on the side that's got a list of all the static versions. Um, we find sometimes, and I fall into this trap myself, I'll be looking at a project, I see a dynamic constraint. Maybe I even change a dynamic constraint, and then I get frustrated as to why the dependency is changing, uh, why it isn't picking up the latest version of something. And uh, it's because there's a dependency lock file on the side somewhere that's being applied, uh, and I don't see it, you know, right there in the in the Gradle file. Um, so it's confusing. Um, an experimental lock plugin that we've got out there uh, on GitHub right now. How do I get out of this thing? Um, you can apply with uh, nebula.lock experimental um, allows us to run Gradle update locks, so kind of similar to the way the mechanism used to work. So Eric, I can't wait for your demon improvements. You saw that? He's your man right there. He's um, and you'll see, rather than creating a dependency lock file on the side, we've just inserted uh, a lock statement right there into the file, so you can't miss it. Um, and uh, so, again, going down this path of, of creating these, these sort of refactoring tools, even for imperative code. Um, since we're a binary integration organization, we don't get the benefits that some companies do, like, like Google or, or you know, Twitter that, are, that, are, that have monorepos, where uh, if they have a low-level library that they want to do a refactoring change in, that, that refactoring change is applied immediately to the entire code base. Um, you know, along with monorepos, you also have like a lot of technical uh, challenges. Um, at Google has, I think, something like 100 engineers working on um, the, that space. Uh, there's four of us. Um, what we would uh, ultimately like to see is an eventually consistent monorepo through distributed refactoring. So we want to extend this Gradle Lint mechanism to allow actual library authors um, to pack Lint rules into their libraries. And then when you get a new version of their library, you, you have a Lint rule. So if they want to they make an API change, 
um, they can just pack that rule right into their jar, and as you pull in that new version, you're gonna you're gonna uh, see that difference. Um, a great example of this is we uh, again I mentioned Netflix is great at, at innovation. Um, long ago, they wrote a uh, class called iLog and its implementation, whatever it's called, that basically does what SLF4J does. So, but it preceded SLF4J in time. You know, they were like visionaries. They saw the future of of, of Java logging. Um, naturally, uh, iLog wound up all over the code base, uh, and to this day, even though you know SLF4J is perfectly sufficient, everybody would ra rather we just use that. There's close to 100,000 references to this old iLog uh, interface still around. And so, you know, that library out there can't deprecate it, can't remove it because, you know, there's just all this depth that's being uh, carried around. Um, if that library author could pack a rule that says, hey, whenever you see iLog references, replace it with SLF4J and, you know, manipulate the arguments in this way or that way, um, they could, you know, quickly affect the organization quickly. Or, um, and, uh, you know, and ultimately remove iLog. That's the, that's the dream. If instead we just did a study and we said, uh, you know, okay, here's this library that contains iLog, here's all the method references to it, and we did something like an email campaign or we put up posters or something like that um, that says, hey, don't use, you know, iLog anymore, use SL4J, um, it might take a while. You know, there'd be a lot of uh, manual tracking and things like that going on. Uh, it may not actually be worth it to us because the business value of substituting iLog for SL4J is very minimal. Um, but if all a, a developer has to do is run fix lint and it's fixed for them, then you know it's easy to adopt. So this is our dream. This is the you know eventually consistent monorepo is what we're going for. So that teams that uh, have heavy manual testing cycles that may take you know several weeks and aren't going to adopt change today can operate at a different pace than teams that are going to, you know, deploy code 10 times a day. Um, that's really what it's at. So, you know, in, in terms of, like, how do we actually manipulate Java code in the same way that we manipulated uh, Gradle files in this way, um, there's a lot to learn. Uh, you know, the AST is very different. Uh, it's very hidden. Um, so, you know, a little toy project that we have out there is almost an aside, a little toy project that we created. Um, we created a Java Power Cert library, which this is something that's familiar to Spock users or to, to Scala test folks. Um, whenever I create an assertion like this, I see a diagram of it rather than just a failure. And the diagram is aware of like the intermediate values that caused an assertion to fail. Um, a lot of the like the machinery that we need to create the uh, distributed refactoring tool for Java code uh, exists in this Java Power Cert library that's uh, available out there on GitHub as well for you to use. And that is uh, that's what I have today. Um, what other questions do you have about either Lint or about Netflix culture in general? Yes, sir. Yeah, and so th the question is, uh, you know, Lint is built on CodeNARC. Will I get all the goodness from the existing rules that exist in the CodeNARC's, uh, CodeNARC's database? That was the original intent. Um, and I really had to add a lot to CodeNARC to allow, like, tracking the, the, the fixes themselves, because that's, you know, not a, a feature. Um, and so, uh, you know, like, I didn't ever go back and tie together, you know, why are the automatically create a Gradle Lint rule implementation out of any arbitrary uh, code arc rule. Um, that is a uh, feature request I've gotten. And uh, if you find, what I'd be interested in is, you know, what code arc uh, violations in particular are useful um, to surface in a build.gradle. And if we can come up with some, then we should add that feature. Sure. Any other questions about you know, again, Gradle Lint or anything, you know, like what it's like to work on Netflix developer productivity. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mike. Um, <laughs> see, we've gotten to the bribery stage of this talk. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we do have our, you know, I'm modeling it right now. We have our nice little uh, Nebula shirts up here for those that desire them. Um, Nebula is our suite of Gradle plugins that, you know, that's out there. This is one of them. 
So, yes, now we have questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or, or organizations? At least for Gradle, yeah. I think we're just right. We're just right. However, we're hiring. So maybe that wasn't the right answer. <laughs> um, no, I, I think we, we keep on top. Of course, there's always a list of things we'd like to do. Uh, you know, and with more people, we could do more. Um, but we managed to keep our head above water. And uh, you know, Danny Thomas is, is there. He is that guy back there. Um, you know, a new version of Gradle will come out, like Gradle 2.14, and that night. Uh, all our Nebula plugins are <laughs> upgraded to Gradle 2.14, so um, there's a lot of them. Uh, and so I think we've gotten pretty good at, um, at iterating quickly and, and keeping up with uh, where Gradle's at as well. Yes, sir? Lint. Yeah, good question. Um, so the question is upgraded through Lint. Um, we don't update our plugins in that way, and we don't really need to because uh, I think what do you do, Danny? Do you have a, like a big batch script that runs through and updates all the wrappers? Yeah, because we use a plugin plugin. So we, we yes. Plug the plug the plug the so yes. Yeah, it's the Nebula plugin plugin, which is very similar in many ways to uh, the Java Gradle plugin, the Gradle Java plugin, is that what it's called? The, the new, the, yeah, so we've got one of these things. So we version this thing and then version everything else. It's, it's like meta, meta, you know, it gets crazy, but um, yeah. So we do imagine that uh, we'll, we'll use, and Nadav Cohen, if he's somewhere in the audience, maybe not, um, he wrote a rule to push people along on Gradle wrapper versions. Uh, internally at Netflix, we actually released a custom distribution, and we have this whole mechanism around, like, automatically updating your clone of the custom distribution locally, and then you sim link it into all your projects so that when we upgrade, you know, our version of our internal wrapper, that uh, you know all your projects get it. But that's really, you know, kind of kludgy, and so uh, we would rather just have projects commit the wrapper to their, their project and have some mechanism to, to move them forward, and that's what that wrapper went rule will do. Yeah. Anything else? Well, if you're too shy or think of something later, uh, we'll be around. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.